first night, uh, Stephen Klingler is going to preach the second night, and on the Wednesday, I'll be preaching the, the Wednesday night, and all of the activities, the Wednesday night activities will be over there as well. So uh, it's coming up. That's coming up. Uh, Exodus 16. I'm going to continue uh, for, for about another week or so on Amazing Grace. I'm going to continue this series this morning, and in, in honor of Mother's Day, I'm preaching Grace for Grumbling. All those grumbling kids that you needed grace for, right? You needed, hey, did you need a lot of grace for my grumbling little rug rat? Oh, just grumbling and complaining and whining. Well, this is grace for grumbling. I dare say that this is probably one of the biggest areas that we as children of God need God's grace. <laughs> grumbling, complaining, whining. So uh, this morning, I'm going to be preaching this to me because I'm guilty of grumbling and complaining and whining. I definitely need this, this message myself. To set up the context of Exodus 16, um, God has miraculously led his children out of bondage. The Israelites have been in bondage for 400 years to, to Egypt. They're making their way across the wilderness to the promised land, the land that God had promised to give to his people, to, to give to the Israelites. It's, it's a land of blessing. It's a land of favor. The land, it says it's flowing with milk and, and honey. It's a prosperous land, a fruitful land, a land that they could call their own. So here in Exodus 16, though, we, we see that instead of them singing praises and Praise God, we're making it to the promised land. We're free. We're off to glory. We're off to, to see our promises become fulfilled. Instead of that, we find them complaining, grumbling, griping. The whole, the whole community, the, all the people are griping and complaining. Scholars estimated to be over a million people in this caravan are griping and complaining. So Exodus 16, verse 2, it says, There too the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. <laughs> there we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us. Oh, to death. And this is crazy to me. Because, I mean, they're acting like they had it so good in Egypt, aren't they? <laughs> like, like, oh, Pharaoh was so good. He threw, a, he threw out a buffet at all different assorted cutlets of meat. And we had prime rib and roast and sirloin. Like one of those, what, uh, what's that, uh, that new buffet where it's all the, the meats? What do they call that? It's like a B Belgian, what was that thing that was? Brazilian, yeah, the Brazilian. Where you got meat after meat. Oh, we had a Brazilian feast. You know, so they act like things are so good. <laughs> but they forgot about the slavery part. <laughs> the bondage, you know. Oh, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. I mean, these are such, <laughs> such so dramatic, aren't they? <laughs> it's amazing how grumbling clouds our sense of reality. You know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of, of when my girls were kids, and we'd go into a store, and you probably had this same thing. You, we'd go into a store, and, you know, kids are always wanting to, can I get this? Can I have this? Can I have this? And they're grabbing this and grabbing, well, can I get this? I mean, always always grabbing stuff and you'd say no and then they'd say stuff like we never get anything <laughs> you never get us anything you never buy i see kim looking at ashley i was i was actually like that you never no. oh she she was perfect wasn't she oh yeah yeah oh you're okay uh, she's she's looking down <laughs> You, you never did anything for your girls. Never. Not one, they never got one thing, did they? Yep. That, see, that's how, that, that's how the Israelites were. It's like complaining and, and griping, you know? They're, they're like the, these, these Israelites. They're like kids. Oh, we never get anything. You never do anything for us. Oh, if we could have ju just left us in, in Egypt. In Egypt. 
But despite their constant complaining, God being the gracious God that he is, he decides to, 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 to give them what they want, to give them food, to give them bread. He said, I'm going to rain bread down every morning. Bread for every morning. When you wake up, there's going to be bread. You're going to have all the supply you need for, for the day. Gather what you need. And when you come back the next morning, it's going to be there. But what's funny is, and I'm, I'm just summarizing the, the scene. What's funny is, the, the first time that the Israelites saw the bread, they didn't know what it was. God had said, I'm going to rain down bread. I'm going to give you the bread. Every, but, but they're like, what is this? Look, look at verse 15 of Exodus 16. It said, the Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. It's like God says, I'm going to give you bread. The bread comes and they walk out and say, what in the world is this? And as a matter of fact, they named the bread manna. Manna means, what is it? <laughs> I, mean, I, could just, I mean, imagine how dumb they must have looked. You know, they're walking out. Manna? Man, manna, 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 all this bread, man, what is it? What is it? What is it? You know that we, we use the, the religious term fresh manna from heaven. You know, we usually refer that to reading the Bible. Fresh. Oh, I'm going to come today to get fresh manna from the pastor the fresh manna of the word of God you know don't say that anymore because basically you're saying I'm wanting fresh what is it <laughs> you know it's amazing how we got these religious terms and we think that manna oh that's the no don't say that what is it? we know what it is it's truth <laughs> so, so manna manna God tells them he's going to send bread from heaven then when he sends it there manna what is it well, if you keep reading 17, 18, 19, read through Exodus, every checkpoint they come to, they're complaining. They're griping, complaining, complaining. Then they start complaining about the manna. Flip over to Numbers 11. Numbers 11 verse 4 says, then the, then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat. Oh, for some meat. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. I mean, they didn't eat that fish for free. <laughs> I mean, are you, are you kidding me? Oh, Pharaoh gave it to us for free. Yeah, after he beat you and put you in chains and made you do hard labor. I mean, I, I, I like fish, but I don't, I don't like it that much. Actually, I don't really even like fish. I like shrimp. And we had all, okay, we had all the fish we could eat for free. And we had all the cucumbers and melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted. There's some bad breath in this crowd right here. I'm, I mean, they're complaining and all the garlic and onions and leeks, and that's random melons. I mean, that's so, that is so random. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna, manna, manna. But what I want you to notice here is it says, Then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. It, basically, the, ones who were the foreigners who were traveling with them, they started complaining. And when they started complaining, that little grumbling spirit jumped on the Israelites and the Israelites were well they're complaining so I guess we need to start complaining too <laughs> the point here is that complaining is contagious praising is contagious but complaining and grumbling is contagious it's amazing how it can start with one person one grumbler can infect a whole community of people 
You know, it's amazing how we can be fine with something. We're satisfied with something. But then someone starts to, someone gets around us and starts pointing out all the things that are wrong with that thing we think we're fine with. Oh, I like that thing. And, and someone starts grumbling about that thing and complaining and, and pointing out all the bad things about that thing. And then, and then, well, we think, well, here's a person that's complaining about that thing. I guess I need to start complaining about it too. We like it. Someone gets around us, points out what they don't like it, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, well, I guess I don't need to, I guess I don't like it either. Because complaining is contagious. I know as a pastor for, for a while now, pastoring in California, Illinois, and here, I've learned that complaining is contagious. <laughs> I can say a big fat amen that complaining is contagious. Oh, yes, even you perfect people sitting in here in the church. Complaining is contagious. Even, even community church, complaining is contagious. You know, I've seen through the, through the actually almost six years of, of even being here. I mean, we've got such an awesome church, a wonderful church, a loving church. But, you know, from time to time, we'll, we'll get some complainers that'll, you know, it's, it's like, you know, when things start going, you know, great, you can expect the devil's going, he's going to fly over and drop a complainer right in the midst. I've seen people, they'll join the church, they'll get, they're all excited about working, and, and they love the ministries of the church. They'll come in and say, oh, I just love the worship music. Oh, I just felt the presence of God. Oh, it's such a great message that you preached, and I love the ministries, and, and then they get connected, and then the devil will drop a grumbler in their path, and that grumbler's complaining about this. You know, they, they like the music, and the grumbler's complaining about the music. They like the preaching, the grumbler's complaining about the, oh, they like the ministries. The grumblers complaining about the ministries. Oh, well, well I, they need to have more of this and, and more of that. And all of us, I've seen that person that's all excited. All of a sudden, they're like, well, I, hmm, I guess I'm not supposed to like it either. And they infect that person with the grumble spirit. And it's a shame the people, and, any, and not that any pastor in town can attest to this. It's a shame to see people get upset and leave and go on down the street or go somewhere else because of another grumble person and that grumble spirit jumped on them and all of a sudden they, ah, I don't like that place anymore. That's how this grumbling works. That's how this, that's how this, this, this complaining spirit works. Proverbs 3.10, listen to this scripture. The Amplified says, through pride and presumption, presuming something, through presuming, through presumption come nothing but strife. Think about that. that might, that'll be a good one. Mothers, that's a good one to write down and give that back to your kids when they start presuming something that's not true. When they start presuming that you never give me anything. Proverbs 13, 10. Through pride and presumption come nothing but strife. Presuming something to be true when it's not true. I'm presuming it. I'm becoming bitter about that thing. I'm complaining about that thing. I'm all upset. Uh, you know, man, that pastor's this, 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 because you might have heard someone else say, Is this? or that ministry is this, 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 because you heard. And, and it's all presumption. You're, you're, it's not even the truth. But through presumption, I'm presuming it, comes nothing but strife. And that was Israel. They should have been grateful to God. They should have been counting their blessings. After all, God rescued them from bondage. But these grumbling foreign rabblers came in, infected them, and they started presuming a lie about Moses. They presumed a lie about Aaron. You know, Moses and Aaron didn't even want to be there really in the first place. And <laughs> Moses, you let us out. They're presuming a lie about God. That's, that's ultimately, they're presuming something about God. That isn't even true. So God, he, he, he has it up to here. How many moms ever said, that? I've had it up to here with you? God has it up to here. And he gets to the place that he has heard enough. And if you scroll down to verse 18, he says, I've got a, I've got a message that, that I want you to give to the people, Moses. And here's his message. 
God says to Moses, say to the people, purify yourselves. For tomorrow, tomorrow, you will have meat to eat. <laughs> you will have meat to eat. <laughs> I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> Just a sentence. You know, I, I could... I have fun when I read my Bible. I'm sorry. I have fun. I, 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 I jump in. I, you were whining, and the Lord heard you when you cried, Oh, for some meat. We were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you some meat, and you will have to eat it. You want some meat? <laughs> I'm going to give you some meat. <laughs> And it won't be just for a day or two or for five or 10 or even 20. And I love this. This is, this is God right here. You will eat it for a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. <laughs> Amen. You want some meat? I'm going to give you some meat. I'm going to give you some meat. You're going to be puking this meat up. It's going to come out of your nose. It's going to come. I'm going to give you some meat. Until you're sick of it. He says, for you have rejected the Lord who is here among you. And, and you have whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? I'm not going to keep harping on that point, even though that's kind of fun to read. <laughs> The point is, God takes grumbling and complaining very seriously. We, we can see through, throughout the history of Israel, he takes grumbling and complaining very seriously. If it's not at the top, it's very near the top of his most offensive list. Grumbling, complaining. Psalms 91, 95, this is such an important issue to God, complaining and grumbling and griping that the psalmist brings it back up in Psalms 95, says you harden your heart in the wilderness. Beware, beware. Even in Hebrews, thousands of years later to the New Testament, the author of Hebrews in, in chapter 3, verse 8 says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. So God, God he, he's re, when, when, you, when you see something reiterated over and over and over again, don't don't you think we need to take it seriously? Because this isn't just in the, in the Old Testament. This is in the New Testament as well. Here's the question. Why is God so offended at grumbling? Maybe you're thinking, why is I mean, complaining? Why is this such a big deal? Because God considers grumbling rebellion. He considers it rebellion. <laughs> Hebrews 3.8, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. This was an act of rebellion. Grumbling is an act of rebellion. It's an act of rejection of the promises of God. Numbers 11 verse 20, again, it says, for you have rejected the Lord. God takes that grumbling and complaining as rebellion and rejection to his word, to his promises. Complaining means we're overlooking the grace of God in our life. Complaining means we're overlooking His love that, that He has poured upon us. Complaining ignores God's faithfulness. One commentator said this, At its core, grumbling is blasphemous. Blasphemous. That goes back to the first command, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's blasphemous because it's saying... I don't believe God will keep his promises. I don't believe God will take care of me. I don't believe God is as good as he says he is. In essence, grumbling is calling God a liar. Whether you mean to call him a liar, he takes it like that. It's rejection. It's rebellion. It's offensive to God. Needless to say, we need a fresh view of God's grace to, to overcome our propensity to grumble and complain about our issues in life. Philippians 4. Turn to Philippians 4. We're going to look to the apostle of grace. The apostle Paul, who shows us how 
to overcome grumbling, who shows us how to apply the grace of God for grumbling. Paul's writing to the Philippian church. He's writing from a jail cell. <laughs> he's in chains. He's, he's in, imprisoned. So if anyone has a reason to grumble, it's the Apostle Paul. And, and Paul, he's addressing some issues in the church. If you read the first few verses of chapter 4, he, he speaks of some, there were some people where there's some divisions, there's some strife. He's basically saying, hey, we, we, you got to get this together. And then he gives us what I think are, are some good points about overcoming grumbling. See, there was strife in the church. There was grumblings in the church. There was complaining in the church. So he says this, after he, after he calls out those who are 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 grumbling and in strife and at odds with each other. He says in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So after he calls out the grumbling, he says, the New King James says, Rejoice in the Lord. Stop complaining. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Look at verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. He's given us an antidote to grumbling. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Three quick points to overcoming grumbling on this Mother's Day. Number one, praise, prayer, and thanksgiving. Rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Take that thing to prayer and then give God thanks. For working it out. That thing that, that you want to grumble. Give God thanks for working it out. See it's hard to grumble. When praise and thanksgiving are on our lips. When you feel the urge to whine. Begin to worship. Yesterday I, I, was, I was vacuuming up the house. And, and this thought came to my mind while I was working. Jesus turned the water into wine. We turn our wine into worship. <laughs> I like that quote. Jesus turned the water into wine. We turn our wine, W-H-I-N, not, not your literal wine. Our wine into worship. Our complaining into praise. You know, if we look back on our lives, I bet we'd all find that some of the things that we whined about Looking back now, we can see, you know, we were complaining at the time, but we didn't realize that God was working out a blessing on our behalf. And here we're complaining about that thing. <laughs> I bet we all have those stories, those, those testimonies. We complained in the moment, not realizing that there was a blessing in the works. We were complaining about that thing. We were complaining about that circumstance. I mean, who would complain and grumble about a new job promotion? Who would complain about a raise? Who would complain about restoration in our family? Nobody's going to complain about a child coming back to the Lord, about, about finding a spouse that God has for you. Maybe there was a split up or you're, uh, you know, you're going through a split up and, oh, it was the worst thing. You're not going to complain about the spouse that the, the spouse that God has brought into your life. But, but see, when you look back, we were complaining about, about those issues when actually God was working a lot of those blessings out into our life. We were complaining about this. We were complaining about the troubles in the homeland, in, in, in our home life. We were complaining about the wayward child. We were complaining about it when all along God was working to bring that kid back, to restore that marriage. You, you, we were complaining about losing that job when all along God had something better in store. You know? And, and my challenge is to think about that grumble-worthy thing in your life right now. Think about that thing that, that, that oh, you just want to complain about, that you want to grumble about. But before you grumble about it, give God praise. Praise God for who he is. Praise God for his promises. Instead of grumbling, that thing that's grumble worthy, take it to God. Take it to God. And then give God thanks. Give God thanks that he's going to turn it around and he's going to bring a blessing. He's going to bring a blessing. I, I guarantee you, if we, you start doing that, you're going to look back maybe five, ten years from now and you'll look back and you'll say, wow, 
I was about to grumble, but little did I realize God was working that blessing out. So number one, praise, prayer, thanksgiving. Continue down to verse 11. Not that I was ever in need. We're still, he's still on the, dealing with the grumblings and the strife and the complaining. He, he, he now uses himself as an example. He says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. See, Paul, he's, he's, he's using himself as an example, letting them know that, that he's learned contentment through his circumstances. He's learned how to be content. One, one point here is, is he learned contentment. He, just did, he wasn't just given contentment. He, he learned the contentment through what he had to go through. The implication to the church, to Philippi, is that if each person would learn to be content... It solve a lot of their problems. If each person learned what true contentment, it solve a lot of the grumbling and complaining, the divisions, the grumblings. You know, it reminds me of times that that I complained as a child. Say, if my mother made a, a meal I didn't like, and I'm grumbling, or say she went out and she she bought an outfit I didn't like, and or bought some shoes I I didn't like. And I'd grumble, and she'd say things like, be content with what you got. Be happy you got what you got. Be happy with those shoes. There's some that don't even have shoes. Be happy with those clothes. Be happy <laughs> with the food that you're eating. There's a lot of people that don't even have that food. And see, as believers, if we would learn to be content, oh, it's, it'd keep us from grumbling, wouldn't it? Here's an important lesson, though, I want you to understand about contentment. Contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not about like you're taking a vow of poverty. You know, you, you, it's not like you're saying, I'm going to sell everything I've got. I'm going to live, you know, on a hill in a shack. I'm going to, I'm going to commit to poverty. And no, that's not contentment. Rather, the contentment that Paul is talking about is a satisfaction with what we've been given through Jesus Christ. It's contentment through Jesus. True contentment is in Jesus. Now, once you get this, so Paul, he, he, he's talking about overcoming rumbling and strifes and divisions and complaining, and he's, he's bringing up this crucial point of contentment, learning to be content. Now, with that in mind, I want you to look at the very next verse, and you know this verse. Philippians 4.13. Because this Philippians 4.13 is one of, the, one of the most misinterpreted, misquoted verses in the Bible. I brought up Romans 8.28 last week. This is another one of those that's often misinterpreted. He says, For I can do everything or all things through Christ who gives me strength. See, this is one of those verses that often people will pull out Isolate it from the overall context of the whole message Paul is trying to convey, and they'll isolate it, and and they'll they'll use this verse as like a inspirational or a motivational type verse. I mean, I, I most sermons I've heard on this verse, I can do all things through Christ, is basically isolated from the whole context, and they'll you know it, this is a good one to preach to graduates. You can do all things through Christ. You can shoot for the stars. You know, we take it and we, we turn it into like a motivational. You can do anything you set your mind. Oh, oh anything you want to do, God will give you strength to do it. And that's usually how we, <laughs> that's usually how we apply it. If I'm a little tired today, oh, I can do all things through Christ. If I need extra, I can do all things through Christ. The problem is, is, is that's taking it out of context. Because when you read it in the context of all of the verses surrounding it and the, whole, and the big idea of the chapter and the book, the way the author intended it, don't you know that the authors, when they wrote this, they, they want us to, uh, 
I want to exegete it. They want us to draw, they want us to read it according to the way they intended it to be read. Don't you know that's if you write something? They, they don't want us changing something. You know, it's, it's like you say, don't put words in my mouth. I didn't mean it that way. We're guilty of this. So when you, when you read this in the context of all the verses, you see that it's a continuating thought. It's a continuing thought from 12 to 13 because there's another conjunction there. The conjunction four. Look at verse 13. Four. I can do all things. So that means you've got to read all of the verses together. Let me give you an example. This is how it should be read. Verse 12, I've learned to be content. I've learned the secret of living in every situation for or because I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Not just pull that in isolation. I've learned to be content. I've learned the secret of living in every situation for because I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So the context is about Christ providing me the strength to be content. It's strength for contentment. It's strength to be content in every situation. That's what Paul is, is, is implying. It's strength to be content with a little and with a lot. I've got Christ's strength to be content in the good times and in the bad times. It's, it's Christ's strength to be content in hardships in persecutions, when things go my way, when things don't go my way. See, that's the strength that he's talking about. It's I have strength through Christ for contentment. For contentment. I have strength to rejoice in all things because I'm content. I have strength to be thankful in all things because I'm content. And that leads to my second point, to overcoming grumbling. Contentment through Christ's strength. Philippians 4.13 is, is about strength for contentment. It's his strength that empowers us to be satisfied and content instead of grumbling, instead of complaining. And you think about this. So when that urge comes to complain about that thing, to whine about that thing, you can look to Philippians 4.13 and says, I have strength to be content and not grumble. Say that out loud when you, when you come to that. I have strength to be content and not grumble. Matter of fact, let's say that right now. Say, say I have strength, I have strength to, be to be content and not grumble. Yeah. I have strength through Christ to be content and not grumble and not complain. There's another interesting observation about contentment here. In the Amplified Version, the Amplified really expounds on this verse. And it says, Philippians 4.13, the Amplified says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. And, and here's what I want to focus on. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Talking about contentment. Self-sufficient. When he says, I am self-sufficient, it doesn't mean, Paul's not implying that he's relying on his own sufficiency. It, he, he, you can basically, uh, it's the implication of being content. I am content. Through Christ's sufficiency. Here's my last point. Of overcoming grumbling. Contentment through Christ's sufficiency. We're, we're content through Christ's strength. Christ's strength empowers us for contentment. Christ's sufficiency. That means Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. Christ's sufficiency. What does Christ's sufficiency mean? We'll go back to Exodus 16 in the wilderness. Remember the grumbling, the complaining over the manna. The Israelites were complaining about the manna because the manna wasn't sufficient. The opposite of contentment is discontentment. They were discontented with the manna because it wasn't sufficient. It didn't satisfy them. Fast forward to John chapter 6, right after Jesus, after he fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes, he's teaching the people. And that 
come, it comes up about the manna in the wilderness. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I'm the, and, and he lets them know that basically Exodus, that, that scripture in Exodus about, about the manna coming down, that was a prophetic picture of me. I'm the bread of life. I am the manna that came down from heaven. They looked at, they, just like they looked at the manna and said, what is it? They looked at me and said, what is it? Who is he? John 1, 11, he came to his own and his own rejected him. His own received him not. So he's the bread. He's the bread. So, so, so what is the sufficiency? What is the sufficiency that we, that we find contentment in through Christ? John 1, 16. John 1, 16, my last scripture. Here's the sufficiency of Christ. It says, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace grace fullness can be intertwined with sufficiency the indication is superabundance so from the sufficiency of Christ from his fullness from his superabundance comes grace upon grace and you could it, it's an exaggeration in the Greek text you could keep on saying and grace and grace and grace and grace upon grace upon grace in other words, the sufficiency of Christ is a continual flow of his grace. It never stops. It never stops. He never runs out of grace. Grace is undeserved favor. You could say from his superabundance flows favor upon favor upon favor upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. Love upon love upon love upon love from his superabundance from his sufficiency is grace for whatever we need see, see we're talking about contentment we're talking about contentment in Christ you know that also that also means grace upon grace also means that the that the finished work of the cross it, it, it is sufficient sufficient keeps giving the blood of Jesus the blood of Jesus keeps cleansing and cleansing and cleansing and cleansing and cleansing from sin Oh, sin's past, sin's present, sin's future. You know, First John talks about that, that the blood continually cleanses us from unrighteousness. From his fullness, his sufficiency, his superabundance, we have received grace upon grace. What about the empty tomb? From his sufficiency flows power. See, the resurrection, the power that raised up Jesus Christ from the grave, it wasn't just a one and done, stop, done, just for Jesus. No, it's a continual power upon power upon power that's continually imparted to believers. We're, we're talking about Jesus is enough. Jesus in Christ, we have everything we need. In Christ, nothing is lacking. Nothing is missing. The point is, in Christ, we're never lacking the spiritual resources we need because from His sufficiency, from His fullness, His superabundance, we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon blessing and favor upon favor upon power upon power upon cleansing and cleansing. It just, as long as, as long as we keep going to Him, the supply keeps coming. And when we find our sufficiency in Jesus, that we've got all we need, that we're abundantly supplied with all the resources, that's what produces a contentment in our souls. Squelching the grumbling and the complaining. The grumbling comes when we try to find sufficiency in someone or something other than Jesus. The complaining and the grumbling comes when we, when we look to another person when we look to a place, when we look to a thing for fulfillment, when only true fulfillment, satisfaction, and sufficiency comes through Christ alone. But here's the key as I close. This is the key. And, and I know this is this, it's easy to look over this because you're like, I know that, I know that. But, but this is so important because it says in John 1.16 again, we have all received received we have to receive this grace 
We have to receive the favor. We have to receive the blessing. We have to receive the power. We have to receive the cleansing. One of the prior verses in John 1 says that, that the law was given, but grace came. See, law, legalism, doing this, doing that, works was forced upon us, but grace came to us. We have to receive it. You know, even, even as believers... <laughs> Even as believers, daily, we have to receive grace daily. We have to receive his blessing and, and his favor. We have to receive it for our lives every single day. And I know you might be thinking, well, I don't deserve to be blessed. I don't deserve his favor. After everything I've done, after, after the sinner I am, I don't deserve his grace. Well, of course you don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. That's what makes it grace. <laughs> That's why it's grace. It's undeserved. What makes it so sufficient and what makes it so satisfying, it makes it so enough, is because none of our efforts, none of our works, none of our righteousness is attached to it at all. It, it completely flows from the throne of God. There, there's no, you, I, I don't contaminate grace by my efforts and by my works and by my trying and doing and measuring. No, it's, it's from Jesus straight into my spirit. See, that's how grace works. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We just receive it. But see, grumbling cuts that flow off, doesn't it? Complaining cuts that flow off. Doubt and unbelief cuts that flow off. But when we receive his grace for our life, we find our contentment in Christ Jesus. I've learned to be content. I've learned to abound. I've learned to, I've learned to, to be in poverty. I've learned this. I've learned in a good time because I found strength to be content. And I found my sufficiency in Christ Jesus. And that's what I'm praying for every single person in here that, that you would find his sufficiency that you would receive the, the grace of God into your life that you would receive the favor of God into your life and, and, and just receive it as, as a free gift oh when, when you realize that everything you've got you, everything you need you already have it in Christ Jesus man when, you, when we realize this man th this is a game changer this changes everything in our life <laughs> And I want to ask you to bow your heads. See, the less we grumble, the more blessing we receive. That complaining restricts the flow of favor and blessings. Let, let's be content. Let's find our sufficiency in Christ Jesus. You, you, maybe you're watching online or you're in the service today and you have never truly received the grace of God into your life. You, you've tried to uh, do good thinking my good works will save me. You've, you think that maybe even coming to church will save you. But the Bible says, for by grace are we saved through faith. We're only saved by grace through faith. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And today you've got the invitation to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receive his grace and be saved today. And I want to just lead you in a prayer. A prayer of repentance, a prayer of acknowledgement for his grace. If you just, just pray after me, if you want to receive Jesus as Savior, say, Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I know you shed your blood for me. Come on, from your heart, just pray that prayer. I know you shed your blood for me. I ask you into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Just ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you. He'll forgive you. His blood will continually cleanse you. Oh, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. Please save me. It's just a prayer, a prayer of faith from your heart will usher you as a child of God. And maybe you're here today and, and maybe you're a Christian and, and maybe you're, you've, you've found yourself in some situations, some grumble-worthy situations. 
I just pray that you would receive God's grace today. Receive God's grace. Receive His strength. Receive His sufficiency. I, I pray, that, the, I pray that, that you would turn the wine into worship. That you'd worship, oh, we've got so much to be thankful for. We've got so much to be blessed for. Oh, God, he's, he's working that, just like the message last week. He's working that thing out, that grumble-worthy thing. Oh, if, if any, anything that's grumble-worthy, I guarantee you there's a greater work in the progress. The greater the propensity to, to grumble, the greater the work that God is about to do in your life. If you could just turn the wine into worship and worship Him and thank Him for what He's about to do. Pray for that strength. Find your sufficiency in Christ Jesus. So I want to pray for you. If, if, if that's you, you're a believer. You believe in Jesus. But, oh, you need grace for the grumble. You need grace. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person would receive the sufficiency of God's grace. The gra it keeps flowing. It keeps flowing. The, the, the favor keeps flowing. I pray that it would keep flowing into their life, that they would, they would receive it. They would open up their life, their heart, to receive your grace, that they would find contentment in Christ, that they would, that they would continually look to the cross, the finished work of the cross, what you have done for us, the blood that continually cleanses us from sin, that, that, you, would empower, that you would empower them with strength for contentment, strength for contentment.